Hello everyone, welcome to Big Data Thoughts. Today we are going to talk about Spark Performance Optimization. This is the second video in this series. In the first video, I had spoken about different things that we can do in the code. But today I'm going to focus on what are the different kinds of configurations, file formats, compression, etc. Which will help us in improving the performance of our code. So let's get started. Let us start with file format and configurations. So Spark supports many widely used file formats like Parquet, ORC, Avro, but generally it is recommended to use Parquet files because they are columnar file formats which gives a lot of efficiency in terms of storage space as well as when we are reading those files and do, while doing the processing. Now Parquet along with a compression, snappy compression is a very good combination to use. So I'll be doing a video uh, next week which will detail into what a Parquet file is, why it is efficient and why it is recommended in Spark. So we'll look at that. But for the moment, let us think that if we have to use a file format, what should be used, which will be efficient. So Parquet along with snappy compression would be very good. Another important parameter is parallelism. Now, if we can increase the parallelism in Spark, we definitely would have a good increase in our performance. And how can we do that? So one way of doing it is there is a parameter in Spark called Spark default parallelism that can be set or we can set Spark SQL files min partition number, which means when Spark tries to read a file, uh, how, and let's say there is a folder and there are multiple files which will be input to our Spark job. When file actually uh, tries to read them, depending on this parameter, if the minimum partition number is let's say set to some value, for example 10, and uh, Spark finds that there are more number of files there, so it can actually spawn another job in parallel to process the rest of the files. So these two parameters can come handy when we want to increase the parallelism in Spark. Then there is one important thing which we have to keep in mind. We spoke about this a bit in our last video as well uh, about garbage collection. Now, whenever there is a garbage collection process that runs, it is going to consume some resources. It is going to consume time and the cost of garbage collection will always be proportional to the number of Java objects that we have created. Whenever we create objects and Java sees a need to evict the old objects, to get in more new objects that's the time when the garbage collection runs now this information is very much available in the logs it is available on the ui as well it shows you how much time it took to garbage collect so and another thing that we should remember is how this garbage collection works is that in spark the whenever we are talking about storing data and if there are some long-lived RDDs, they will be stored in the old generation. So garbage collection would have something called old generation and something called young generation. Now objects or RDDs which are to be stored for a longer time will be stored in old generation. The ones which are to be stored for uh, some time or temporarily, they will go to the young generation. And what will happen is usually the, the short term objects which are there in young generation. Now young generation also has like three parts in which it is divided. Okay. But uh, if we don't want to go into those details of garbage collection, but just to uh, explain that how it is working is since the short term objects are in young generation, when it gets filled up, there will be a partial GC or a, or a minor GC that will run. But when the old generation gets filled up, that is when a full GC is run. So full GC consumes much more time resources than the partial GC or minor GC. So what we need to keep in mind is what kind of objects are we creating. Now, uh, even to understand how much time the garbage collection is taking, how much resources it is taking, we should actually put this parameter in our uh, parameter which will help us to get the details in the worker logs as well as we can see the details in the UI also and accordingly decide on how we are going to create our objects and how we want to tune our program. The next is serialization. So whenever we are trying to <coughs> store an object or we are trying to do a network transfer of our data, 
that is when the process of serialization or deserialization takes place this can also take place if you are writing udfs because when we write a udf for a custom code to process data at that time spark has to read each row of my data set uh, deserialize it apply the lambda function and then serialize it so this deserialization serialization is going to happen a number of times and it is important for us to understand what kind of serializer or uh, that we should use so that this whole process is optimized so the recommended uh, serializer that needs to be used is a cairo serializer we can set a property in our conf which will specify that the serializer has to be cairo by default J java serializer is used but cairo is much more efficient almost 10 times more efficient so we need to explicitly go and set this serializer uh, then another property is dynamic allocation so whenever we have multi tenant environments it is preferable to have dynamic allocation what that means that means that uh, as per our need the cluster or uh, the number of executors that the job needs will grow and shrink so we will specify minimum number of executor and maximum number of executor because these properties help spark to understand what is our requirement but since it is a dynamic allocation and we can enable this by setting the property dynamic allocation enabled so what spark will do is if it sees that this particular job needs more than the number of executors that we have specified it will dynamically get more number of executors but if it sees that the number of executors that we have specified is not required then it will release those executors so many a times there is a misconception that since it is dynamic allocation we can just go ahead and set anything that we want we should not do that because what will happen is if we set number of executors which is much more than what we need then spark will unnecessarily be releasing those executors so it's an overhead getting executors and then releasing it so it is better always to understand how big our job is how much data it is going to um, consume what is the complexity of our transformation and accordingly give the number of executors that is advisable similarly it is a good practice to specify minimum and maximum executors because in dynamic allocation also that limit will help spark to know how many executors can be acquired so that one job does not hog the complete cluster or all the resources we can also set the executor idle uh, time out so these properties should be set if there is dynamic allocation that has been set for our cluster then a uh, set of properties like number of executor executor memory number of core these are extremely important properties because they decide how our job is going to execute so when we do this process of understanding what numbers to give to the number of executors memory etc it's a titration there is no set formula to say that if the data is this much this should be the number of executors it is more of a titration and understanding of our job where we understand what kind of operations we are doing how much data are we going to consume so we set some number of executors memory and core there are calculations which tell us that if the total cluster has x amount of memory how much should we assume per executor and all of that that can be done but it is still a titration or a ballpark number that we gave it's not an exact calculation so we should be careful when we are setting these properties we should not overestimate or underestimate thinking that dynamic allocation will take care of our uh, you know expanding and shrinking on the number of executors because that is going to affect the performance if you keep releasing executor or keep acquiring executors so these properties have to be titrated and we have to come up with a proper value then another thing that we can do is utilizing the off heap memory now we had seen uh, this in the memory management video that i had done for spark that off heap memory is little bit slower than the on heap memory but this is better because it gives us some extra space beyond the on heap memory that we have and also it is free from garbage collection because it's not an on heap memory the we can avoid that garbage collection overhead totally so that will also help in performance then there are disk spills that will happen like in the shuffle scenarios of if we are caching data and the data goes beyond our memory we have 
uh, set that our cache can be disk as well as memory in the those kind of scenarios there will be disk spills so and this disk spills are going to be expensive because there will be a lot of time and effort spent in writing the data to disk and then getting it back from the disk so some things that we can do from our end is because we know during shuffle there are going to be disk spills we can set the size of the uh, shuffle file buffer we can use shuffle compress shuffle spill compress all of these are going to help in reducing the disk spill size we can also set what will be our compression snappy block size these properties if we set properly that is going to help us in reducing the disk spills and in turn increase our performance so this is a summarization of today whatever we have seen in terms of performance like using file format uh, which is parquet along with snappy compression when we do serialization we use cairo serializers we can utilize off heap memory in addition to our on heap memory this will save us garbage collection as well as give us extra space we can use dynamic allocation but with a caution that we specify minimum and maximum executors and we make sure that whatever configurations we are setting in terms of executor core and memory those are highly optimized we titrate we we may use certain tools like unravel etc or the logs to check how much is the utilization how many executors we actually need for the job and then accordingly titrate those properties also we can play around with the garbage collection there are different kinds of garbage collection algorithms that can be used and also we can take care of what objects are we creating and how our job is performing so this is the overall uh, things that we saw today i hope this really helps you in optimizing your jobs using certain configurations and file formats thank you so much